Our subject this morning is a continuation of the series, Following Jesus in the Days of His Flesh. Our subject is, Is Jesus Still in the Foot-Washing Business? There is a new book that I would like to write. Right now we have three that are in process of coming out, and one's already, or two I guess, are in the hands of the publisher, and one will be out a little later. But there is another book, and I wish I could get around to it. I already have the title of the book. The title of it would be The Contemporary Christ. And I would have three divisions in the book. I'd speak of that which is so familiar to most of us, the intercession of Christ, and that is our great high priest standing at the golden altar in heaven today for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And then I would have a second division, the inspection of Christ. And that is the subject we spoke on recently when we saw that he's the one that takes care of the golden lampstand. And that golden lampstand is the place where he's inspecting his church and believers today. That is a very important ministry that he's carrying on at the present time. Then the third division would be the subject of the morning are the intervention of Christ, and he steps outside of the holy place to the lava, where he washes the feet of those that are his, and he continues that ministry today. Now, we come this morning to that incident where our Lord washed his disciples' feet. It was in connection with the Last Supper and it was yonder in the upper room. The Lord had made ample and adequate preparation for the celebration of the Passover with his disciples. I wonder if you've noted how carefully he'd made the arrangements. He had arranged for the place. I do not think we need to read in a miracle and say that it was just a miracle that they followed this man, and the man just miraculously opened up the upper room. That's not necessary. That man was a follower of the Lord Jesus. Our Lord had met him somewhere, and this man had said to him, if you ever have any need of anything that I have, it's yours. And I think our Lord said to him, I'll be coming into Jerusalem, and I want to celebrate the Passover with my disciples. I've desired to celebrate the Passover with him. We'd like to have that lovely upper room that you have. And the man says, it's yours, just let me know. And so that is exactly, I think, what took place. The disciples let him know, and he says, it's available, it is there for you. And he arranged for the food, for they had food there in the upper room. He arranged for the elements that went in to the Passover feast. All was taken care of. He chose the place. He made provision, and everything was ready, and it was because the Lord desired, he said, to eat this Passover with them before he suffered. Now, at the very beginning of this feast, he did an unprecedented thing. It was something that apparently there was no preparation for it. It looked as if he did it just on the spur of the moment, as if he had not thought it over at least without any previous announcement or provocation, he arose from the table and he laid aside his garments, he girded himself with a towel, and then he moved about with a basin of water and he began to wash his disciples' feet. Why did he do it? May I say to you that, no, don't blame the host there. I have read commentaries and I have heard men say that the host there, the owner of the place, had neglected this common courtesy. I say to you this morning, he had not neglected it at all. To begin with, he is not the host in the upper room. Our Lord is the host. He wasn't present up there in the upper room. 
But he had made every arrangement. Where did that basin come from? And where did that water come from that was in the upper room? He had made adequate arrangements. The host had not neglected the common courtesies of that day. The water, the basin, and the towel were all there. And may I say that we don't want to blame him. Why did our Lord do this? Well, John gives us here, and he's the only one that records this incident, he gives us at least three reasons. There may be others, but I merely left out the reasons that John gives this morning, and will you note them? Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Now what he's getting ready to do, he does it in light of the fact that he knows that before long, in fact just a few days now, he'll be leaving the world and he'll be going back to the Father. And he'll be at the Father's right hand. And in view of the fact that he's leaving them and leaving this world and going back to the Father, he washes their feet. May I say to you, that's important to see. That's one of the reasons that he washed his disciples' feet. He did it in view of the fact he was leaving and going to the Father's right hand. And then the second reason, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Or let me change it just a little bit. Having loved his own, he kept on loving them right on down to the very end, having loved his own. What he did, he did as a token of love. He did it because of his great love for the disciples. And this act, whatever be the meaning of it, is an expression on his part of his great love for these men. And his love was not a temporary thing. It's not going to depend on any vacillating conduct on their part. It'll not depend on these men's character. It'll not even depend on their conduct. It will depend on just one thing, the thing he's doing. He loves them and he's going to keep on loving them regardless of what happens right on down to the very end. So he washes their feet. That's the second explanation that's given for him washing the disciples' feet. There is a third reason here. Strange reason this is. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And there was a guest there who was not invited. He got no invitation, but he was there. In fact, there were 13 in the upper room besides our Lord. Two of them left. Satan and Judas left. And the only way that Satan could get in the upper room was through a disciple. Do you know that the devil cannot get into the church of the open door by himself? No, he can't. He has to come in with one of you. That's the only way in the world he can get in. He can't come in by himself. May I say, God has him blocked. But he can come in through you. And so the devil got into the upper room. That is the most sacred service our Lord had. And Judas Iscariot was not present for the Last Supper. Our Lord got rid of him before that. But he did get his feet washed. I wonder what he thought. It must have been embarrassing for him as he reclined there and our Lord took that basin of water and put a foot in it and scrubbed it, then took a towel and dried it and put it aside, put the oven in. Judas didn't say a word. I think he did a lot of thinking. I think he said, oh, I wonder if he knows. 
Oh, this is a hellish thing I'm getting ready to do. I'm not sure because our Lord washed his feet. This is the reason the man said later on, I betrayed innocent blood. Conscience finally caught up with him. He went out and hanged himself and went to his place. May I say to you that the devil came into the upper room and when he did, our Lord began to wash feet. Now these are the three reasons why the Lord Jesus arose from this meal and did something as far as the record is concerned he had never done previously and certainly he never did it after this on this earth. And he did it for these three reasons, let's recapitulate them for just a moment. They're important. He is going to leave the earth and going to leave them on the earth. And he's going back to the Father's right hand and because he's leaving them, he washed their feet. Second, having loved them. His love was not a flighty sort of thing. It was not an emotion. He's going to keep on loving them right on down to the very end. That's the second thing. And then that sly, slick monster slipped into the upper room, Satan, and our Lord knew it. I don't think anybody else knew he was there. Our Lord knew he was there, and he washed his disciples' feet. Now let's look at it, because with that in mind, we may be able to interpret the thing that he's doing here and come to an understanding of just what our Lord meant when he washed his disciples' feet. Now, he rises from the meal. I do not know how far they'd proceeded in it. I think they were somewhere down in the meal. You see, they ate before they came to the Passover proper. And while they're eating, our Lord rises and they wonder what he's going to do. It's unusual. You see, they're reclining on couches. Their feet are all protruding out away from the table. And our Lord rises. He goes over and gets that basin of water that the host downstairs had so courteously and thoughtfully arranged for the upper room. But apparently it hadn't been used. Our Lord purposely omitted it when they entered the room. Now he rises as if he'd forgotten it. And he goes and lays aside his garment, the seamless robe that the next day soldiers ought to gamble for it. And he puts around himself the towel. And he takes that basin of water and he comes to the feet of the disciples. I wish this morning that we could go around with him. I personally like to try to explore the thinking of each disciple. I wonder what Thomas thought. Thomas was always in a quandary. He had a question mark for a brain anyway, and he never was sure about the next step. I wonder, Thomas, I wonder what in the world he's doing. Why is he doing this? Why is he washing our feet? Nathaniel, who was the skeptic at the beginning, is probably saying, I don't know why he's doing it, but whatever it is, I'm for it. <laughs> Anything he does, I'm for it now. I used to think differently, but I'm for it. I'll catch on later. I, he does so many things that I don't catch on to later. And then he comes to Simon Peter. You expected to hear from him. Simon Peter's watched him as he's come around all of these couches. And as he got closer to Simon Peter, Simon Peter was gradually moving his feet up under him. Time our Lord got to him, Simon Peter's sitting on his feet. He says, you're not going to wash my feet. I don't want you to wash my feet. And our Lord says, if, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now, what do you mean? Simon Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you're going to lose your salvation? Oh, no. No, he makes it very clear what he's talking about. He says, if I don't wash your feet, you're not going to have fellowship with me. My washing your feet is the thing 
that depends on our fellowship. And if I do not wash your feet, then you have no fellowship with me. If I wash your feet, you will have fellowship with me. And this man, Simon Peter, he's an emotional fellow, juvenile. He never did move from that area until the day of Pentecost, and then he became a full-grown man spiritually. Oh, he had difficulties even after that, but he became full-grown spiritually. But on this day, he pulls his feet up here, and now when our Lord says, you won't have fellowship with me, he sticks out his feet. Big old feet they must have been. And he holds out his hands, and they must have been big hands. And he even held down his head. He says, not just my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head. If it means fellowship, I want fellowship with you. So wash my head. Wash my hands. Our Lord said, Simon, it's not necessary to wash your head or your hands. I just need to wash your feet. And so Simon Peter led him, and then our Lord said this. And our translation, unfortunately, does not bring out a distinction that should be made here. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you're clean, but not all. Now, he says... He that's washed needeth not wash. That doesn't make good sense, does it? Doesn't to me. But he used two different words, and unfortunately the translators didn't make that distinction. And unfortunately some of our recent translations don't make the distinction. But they are absolutely two different words. He says, he that is luo. Luo means bathed. He that is bathed need not save to be nipto, that is, washed, except his feet. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, it's an oriental custom. It's the oldest custom you find in the Bible. It goes way back before the Mosaic system. You find Abraham, when he had these three heavenly guests that came to his tent door and to his oasis there, This man, Abraham, says, let water be brought and wash your feet. Now, that's a funny thing to do. Our custom today is that when someone comes to see us for dinner, we say, would you like to wash your hands? Now, I eat out a great deal, but nobody up to the present moment has ever asked me, have you washed your feet? (laughs) Or would you like to wash your feet? May I say to you that Abraham said that to his guests, and the reason was this, that they wore sandals. They had no such thing as a garbage pail in that day, nor garbage collectors. They'd never had the scandal we've had in Los Angeles about garbage collecting, because the garbage dump place was out in the street, and when you walked down the street with these sandals on, Your feet got dirty, and every time you came in the house, you took off your sandals, and when you did, there was a basin of water, and you just washed your feet. And the picture is, the Romans had instituted baths. We blame the Romans for a great many things, but do you know that they introduced the bath? Wonderful innovation. And because, honestly, many of our ancestors in Scotland, some of you came from up there, Do you know that in those early days that many a man could say and boast of it he'd never had a bath? And they tell me that they didn't have to say it. You knew it when you got around them. (laughs) It was a wonderful invention that the Romans brought. And Christianity, may I say to you, has cleaned people up outside as well as on the inside. And my brother, if it doesn't clean you up on the outside, The chances are it didn't clean you up on the inside. Every man that belongs to Christ wants to be clean, both outside and inside. Someone has said cleanliness is next to godliness. I think it was John Wesley. It's true. What a wonderful thing. 
And so the Romans had introduced the bath. That was a public affair, by the way. And a man would go down to the bath, and he would take a bath. He'd come out, and he'd put on his garments. And on his walk from the bath to his home, his feet got dirty. And when his feet got dirty, he'd step inside the house. There was the basin. He washed his feet. Now, he didn't need to take a bath because he's already had a bath. It's only his feet that are dirty. And now he just washes his feet, you see. That's the figure that our Lord is giving. He's saying to his disciples, Now the one that has been bathed, he need not wash save his feet. And in that we find the meaning of this wonderful thing our Lord instituted and what is the meaning of it. Now, there are three meanings for the business of foot washing, and frankly, I can concur with all three of them, although I believe that if you only catch the first two and miss the third, you've really missed it. But will you notice these three meanings, and they're all here. The first one is found in verse 15. Our Lord says, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Now, there are those today that believe that this is a sacrament that our Lord instituted. May I say, I see nothing wrong with it at all. I was speaking on the 13th of John. It must have been 15 years ago when I was pastor in Pasadena. And the next morning, I met Dr. Paul Bauman, the son of the late Dr. Louis Bauman of the First Brethren Church in Long Beach. I met him out here. He said to me, he said, Dad and I listened to your broadcast yesterday, and he wanted me to tell you that he agreed with everything that you said. Now, if you this morning believe that you ought to practice foot washing, you're going to agree with everything that I'm going to say. But may I add this, that if you see in this only a service to be performed, may I say to you that you've missed it. Because although the service may be a fine thing to perform, and I believe in foot washing, I think it's good, regardless whether it's in the church or out of the church, foot washing is a marvelous thing. And so I find nothing wrong with this as a ceremony, I find nothing wrong with it at all. That's the first thing. The second is this. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, the thought here is not only to do this, but you're to do it because if I, your Lord and Master, did it to you, then you should do it, and that teaches humility. And may I say that that's a wonderful lesson to learn. But you know you can miss that even in foot washing. I asked a friend of mine, he's a wonderful friend, I said to him, uh, when you go to the foot washing service, do you make sure that you put on a pair of socks that do not have holes in them? Oh, he says, I sure do. I said, do you wash your feet before you go? He says, I sure do. Well, I said, now why do you do that? Well, he said, you know, you just want to be right about the thing. Well, I said, fine. But I said, doesn't that really destroy the humility that's there? You can be proud that your socks don't have holes in them, and you can be proud that you wash your feet, and you wouldn't dare go without these things being true. That could minister to pride rather than to humility. In other words, instead of being an humble act, it could be a proud act. So the act in and of itself does not necessarily mean that it is humility. It ought to be. And it's a wonderful thing, because there are those that tell me that it blesses their heart to kneel down and wash the feet of someone else. May I say to you that if you find that to be true, then God bless you in the act. But again, may I say that there's more than meets the eye here. For our Lord said this, after he'd washed their feet, and after he'd taken his garment again and reclined 
He turned to his disciples, and they're still looking about in amazement. He says, Know ye what I have done to you? Well, if it's just washing feet, I think Simon Peter would have blurted out and said, Sure, I know what you did. You washed their feet. But there's more to it than that. And not only that, he repeated that again in verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. If you know what? Did, didn't they know their feet had been washed? Certainly. Didn't they know that he'd said that I, your Lord and Master, do this? You ought to do it? Certainly. But will you notice he had said this? Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking now to Simon Peter, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Simon Peter, you don't see what I'm doing now. Well, I can see you're washing my feet. I can certainly see you are my Lord and Master, and it embarrasses me for you to wash my feet. Oh, this is humbling. I see that. Yeah, but Simon Peter, you don't see what I'm doing now. You will see hereafter. And they all saw hereafter. John continues it when he got to his first epistle, which he wrote last. What was it he did to them? He did to them down here what he's doing up yonder right now. That's part of his ministry, the contemporary Christ. This morning, at God's right hand, He's come out to the lava, and he's there to wash the feet of those that are his own. For what he did, he did because he was going back to the Father. And having loved his own, he loved them right on down to the very end. And Satan gets into his flock. And you and I, as his children, we have first come to the cross of Christ. We've come to that brazen labor, that brazen altar, and at that brazen altar, we have been declared righteous because the blood of Christ was shed for us. But on the way from the cross to the crown, on the way through this world, as you and I walk through this world today, from the day we are saved until the day he takes us back under the glory, all the way, you and I get our feet soiled. Oh, I know, there are people who say they don't get their feet soiled. All God's children get their feet soiled. You can't walk down the streets of Los Angeles today without getting your eyes soiled, your ears soiled, your feet soiled, your hands soiled. And don't say you don't. Oh, there's so many saints today that won't deal with sin in their lives. On the way from the cross to the crown we get dirty. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We get dirty. When you get dirty, what do you do? What do you do? There are two things that he says we are to do. He today is girded with the towel of service standing at the laver. He not only stands at the golden altar, he not only stands at the golden lampstand, he stands at the laver. It's still filled with water. No, it's filled with blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, just keeps on cleansing us from all sin. And we go to him, and we say, Lord Jesus, it's embarrassing, but here I'm back here again, my feet are soiled. I want to have fellowship with you. Won't you take my feet and wash them? 
and he the Savior, because he loves his own, and he'll love them right down to the end, and because he's at God's right hand, and because Satan does get through to us, he just washes our feet, and then we can have fellowship with him. If we read his word, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Cleanse them. Paul, speaking of the church that he's to present to himself, he says today the thing that Jesus is doing with that church in order to present it without spot and blame is that he washes it with water by the word. Oh, don't mind me saying this. The TV advertisers are just coming into our living room and shocking us today. They say, do you use this deodorant? Have you used this soap? I heard of the Texan while I was away that he fills his swimming pool with deodorant. Well, that's all right. May I say to you, this word is God's deodorant. Did you take a bath in it before you came to church this morning? Then the second, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you confessed? Oh, I said a few words. That's not it. Homologia means you come over on God's side. You look at yourself and you say what God says about yourself. He says it's sin. You say it's sin. You say What God says, God says you're to forsake it. You say, I forsake it. That's confession. And then we read, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he takes that soil foot and he washes it so that he can have fellowship with us. My friend today, have you confessed? Have you washed in the water of the word? I want to make an observation and close. I've looked into many churches, many places today. If there is any place in America where a revival could begin, it's at the church of the open door. Why doesn't it begin here? Now, TV tells you this, so don't mind your preacher saying it. There is too much spiritual B.O. We can't have fellowship with him until we are washed in the water of the word, until we confess to him. And when we do, I'm talking to believers now, he says, we can have fellowship with him. You know this morning your own spiritual condition. I don't. You know today whether you're having fellowship with him or not. You know whether you confess or not. You know today whether you are in the Word or not. You will have to answer that. I'll not ask this morning for any sign, because I don't think you ought to take a bath in public. But I do think many of us ought to go home and confess. Shall we pray? Our gracious, loving Father God, we thank Thee this morning. For a Savior who not only died 1,900 years ago, but now lives to keep us saved, who this morning above everything else wants fellowship with us, who says he loves us and he'll love us right on down through the end, but that we can't have fellowship when we have unconfessed sin. We can't have fellowship when we're not in the Word. Many of us today are cold and many of us are dirty. Oh, God, scrub us, clean us up, warm us up, that we might get back to the place where the Spirit of God can move in mighty power through our own hearts and our own lives. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.